Hi guys, before we start class 8 NCRT history textbook, let's recall what we learned in chapter 10 of class 7 history textbook. So the 10th chapter was 18th century political formations. So we know that the Mughals started declining. So what are the reasons for their decline? Uh, it was that uh, these were caused by a number of factors. Emperor Aurangzeb had depleted the military and financial resources of his empire by fighting a long war in the Deccan. Under his successors, the efficiency of the imperial administration broke down. It became interestingly difficult for the later Mughal emperors to keep a check on their powerful mansabdars. Nobles appointed as governors, mansabdars, often controlled the offices of revenue and military administration. Diwani and Fajdari as well. This gave them extraordinary political, economic and military powers over vast regions of the Mughal Empire. As the governors consolidated their control over the provinces, the periodic remission of revenue to the capital declined. Peasant and Jamindari rebellions in many parts of northern and western India added to these problems. These revolts were sometimes caused by the pressures of mounting taxes. At some times there were attempts by powerful chieftains to consolidate their own positions. Mughal authority had been challenged by rebellious groups in the past as well, but these groups were now able to seize the economic resources of the reason to consolidate their positions. The Mughal emperor after Aurangzeb were unable to arrest the gradual shifting of political and economic authorities into the hands of provincial governors, local chieftains and other groups. In the midst of this economic and political crisis, the ruler of Iran, Nadir Shah, sacked and plundered the city of Delhi in 1739 and took away immense amounts of wealth. This invasion was followed by a series of plundering raids by the Afghan ruler Ahmed Shah Abdali who invaded North India five times between 1748 and 1761. Already under severe pressure from all sides, the empire was further weakened by competition amongst different groups of nobles. They were divided into two major groups or factions, the, Iranian, the Iranis and Turanis, nobles of Turkish descent. For a long time, the later Mughal emperors were puppets in the hands of either one or the other of these two powerful groups. The worst possible humiliation came when two Mughal emperors, Farukh Shiar and Alamgir II, were assassinated and two others, Ahmed Shah and Shah Alam II, were blinded by their nobles. So let's see the emergence of new states. With the decline in the authorities of the Mughal emperors, the governors of large provinces, that is Mansabdars and the great Jamindars, consolidated their authority in different parts of the subcontinent. Through the 18th century, the Mughal Empire gradually fragmented into a number of independent regional states. Broadly speaking, the states of the 18th century can be divided into three overlapping groups. The first one is that states that were old Mughal provinces like Awadh, Bengal and Hyderabad. Although extremely powerful and quite independent, the rulers of these states did not break their formal ties with the Mughal emperor. Then the second form of states were the states that had enjoyed considerable independence under the Mughals as Watan Jagirs. This included several Rajput 
principalities. So examples are Rajput principalities. And number three, the last form of states were the last group included states under the control of Marathas, Sikhs and others like the Jats. These were of differing sizes and had seized their independence from the Mughals after a long drawn armed struggle. So let's see the old Mughal provinces. Amongst the states that were carved out of the old Mughal provinces in the 18th century, three stand out very prominently. These were Awadh, Bengal and Hyderabad. All three states were founded by members of the high Mughal nobility who had been governors of large provinces. Number one, Sadat Khan in Awadh and Murshid Ghali Khan in Bengal and Asaf Jah in Hyderabad. All these had, all three had occupied high Mansabdari positions and enjoyed the trust and confidence of the emperors. Both Asaf Jah and Murshid Ghali Khan held a Jat ranked of 7,000 each, while Sadat Khan's Jat was 6,000. So let's come to the province of Hyderabad. So Nizam ul Mulk Asaf Jah, the founder of Hyderabad state, was one of the most powerful members at the court of the Mughal emperor Farukh Shir. He was entrusted first with the governorship of Awad and later given charge of the Deccan. As the Mughal governor of the Deccan provinces, Asaf Jah already had full control over its political and financial administration. Taking advantage of the turmoil in the Deccan and the competition amongst the court nobility, he gathered power in his hands and became the actual ruler of that region. Asaf Jah brought skilled soldiers and administrators from northern India who welcomed the new opportunities in the south. He appointed Mansabdars and granted Jagirs. Although he was still a servant of the Mughal emperor, he ruled quite independently without seeking any direction from Delhi or facing any interference. The state of Hyderabad was constantly engaged in a struggle against the Marathas to the west and the independent Telugu warrior chiefs, Nayakas, of the Plechu. The ambitions of the Nizam to control the rich textile producing areas of the Coromandel coast in the east were checked by the British who were becoming increasingly powerful in that reason. So let's come to Awad. Burhan ul Mulk Sadat Khan was appointed Subedar of Awad in 1722 and founded a state which was one of the most important to emerge out of the breakup of the Mughal Empire. Awad was a prosperous reason controlling the rich alluvial Ganga plain and the main trade route between North India and Bengal. Burhan ul Mulk also held the combined offices of Subedari, Diwani and Fajdari. In the other words, he was responsible for managing the political, financial and military affairs of the province of Awadh. He also reduced the size of Jagirs and appointed his own loyal servants to vacant positions. The accounts of Jagirdars were checked to prevent cheating and the revenue of all districts were reassessed by officials appointed by the Nawab's court. He seized a number of Rajput Jamindaris and the agriculturally fertile lands of the Afghans of Rohil Khan. The state depended on local bankers and mahajans for loans. It sold the right to collect tax to the highest bidders. These revenue farmers, Ijaradars, uh, agreed to pay the state a fixed sum of money. Local bankers guaranteed the payment of this contracted amount to the state. 
In turn, the revenue farmers were given considerable freedom in the assessment and collection of taxes. These developments allowed new social groups like moneylenders and bankers to influence the management of the state's revenue system, something which had not occurred in the past. Now let's come to the province of Bengal. Under Bengal gradually broke away from Mughal control under Mursid Ghali Khan, who was appointed as the Naib, deputy to the governor of the province. Although never a formal subedar, Mursid Ghali Khan very quickly seized all the power that went with that office. Like the rulers of Hyderabad and Awad, he also commanded the revenue administration of the state. In an effort to reduce Mughal influence in Bengal, he transferred all Mughal jagirdars to Orissa and ordered a major reassessment of the revenues of Bengal. Revenue was collected in cash with great strictness from all jamindars. As a result, many jamindars had to borrow money from bankers and moneylenders. Those unable to pay were forced to sell their lands to larger jamindars. The close connection between the state and bankers noticeable in Hyderabad and Awad as well was evident in Bengal under the rule of Ali Khan from 1740 to 1756. During his reign, the banking house of Jagat Seth became extremely prosperous. If we take a bird's eye view, we can detect three common features amongst the states. The first is, though many of the larger states were established by erstwhile Mughal nobles, they were highly suspicious of some of the administrative systems that they had inherited, in particularly the Jagirdari system. Now, number two. Their method of tax collection differed. Rather than relying upon the officers of the state, all three regimes contracted with revenue farmers for the collection of revenue. The practice of Ijaradari, thoroughly disapproved of by the Mughals, spread all over India in the 18th century. Their impact on the countryside differed considerably. Now, number three. These regional states was their emerging relationship with rich bankers and merchants. These people lent money to revenue farmers, received land as security and collected taxes from these lands through their own agents. Throughout India, the richest merchants and bankers were gaining a stake in the new political order. Many Rajput kings, particularly those belonging to Ambar and Jodhpur, had served under the Mughals with distinction. In exchange, they were permitted to enjoy considerable autonomy in their Watan Jagirs. In the 18th century, these rulers were attempted to extend their control over adjacent regions. Ajit Singh, the ruler of Jodhpur, was also involved in the fractional politics at the Mughal court. These influential Rajput families claimed the Subedari with of the rich provinces of Gujarat and Malwa. Raja Ajit Singh of Jodhpur held the governorship of Gujarat and Sawai Raja Jay Singh of Ambar was governor of Malwa. These officers were renewed by Emperor Jahandar Shah in 1713. They also tried to extend their territories by seizing portions of imperial territories neighboring their Watans. Nagar was conquered and annexed to the house of Jodhpur, while Ambar seized large portions of Bundi. Sawai Raja Jay Singh founded his new capital at Jaipur and was given the Mansab Dari was given the Subedari of Agra in 1722. Maratha campaigns into Rajasthan from the 1740s 
put severe pressure on these principalities and check their further expansion. The six, the organization of the six into a political community during the 17th century helped in regional state building in the Punjab. Several battles were fought by Guru Govind Singh against the Rajputs and Mughal rulers, both before and after the institution of the Khalsa in 1699. After his death in 1708, the Khalsa rose in revolt against the Mughal authority under Banda Bahadur's leadership, declared their sovereign rule by striking coins in the name of Guru Govind Singh and Guru Nanak, and established their own administration between the Satluj and the Jamuna. Banda Bahadur was captured in 1715 and executed in 1716. The Sikh organized themselves into a number of bands called Jathas and later on Missiles. Their combined forces were known as the Grand Army, Dal Khalsa. The entire body used to meet at Amritsar at the time of Baishakhi and Diwali to take collective decisions known as resolutions of the Guru, Gurmatas. A system called Rakhi was introduced offering protection to cultivators on the payment of a tax of 20% of the produce. Guru Govind Singh had inspired the Khalsa with the belief that their destiny was to rule. Raj Karega Khalsa. Their well knit organization enabled them to put up a successful resistance to the Mughal governors first and then to Ahmed Shah Abdali, who had seized the rich province of the Punjab and the Sarkar of Sirhind from the Mughals. The Khalsa declared their sovereign rule by striking their own coin again in 1765. The Sikh territories in the late 18th century extended from the Indus to the Jamuna, but they were divided into different rulers. One of them, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, reunited these groups and established his capital at Lahore in 1799. Now the Marathas. Sivaji carved out a stable kingdom with the support of powerful warrior families, Deshmukhs. Groups of highly mobile peasant pastoralist Kunbis provided the backbone of the Maratha army. Sivaji used these forces to challenge the Mughals in the peninsula. After Sivaji's death, effective power in the Maratha state was wielded by a family of Jitpavan. Brahmanas who served Sivaji's successors as Peswa or principal minister. Pune became the capital of the Maratha kingdom. Under the Peswas, the Marathas developed a very successful military organization. Between 1720 and 1761, the Maratha empire expanded. Malwa and Gujarat were seized from the Mughal by the 1720s. By the 1730s, the Maratha king was recognized as the overlord of the entire Deccan Peninsula. He possessed the right to levy Choth and Sardesh Mukhi in the entire region. After reading daily in 1737, the frontiers of Maratha domination expanded rapidly into Rajasthan and the Punjab in the north, into Bengal and Orissa in the east, and into Karnataka and the Tamil and Telugu countries in the south. These were not formally included in the Maratha Empire but were made to pay tribute as a way of accepting Maratha sovereignty. Expansion through enormous resources. Expansion brought enormous resources, but it came at a price. These military campaigns also made other rulers hostile towards the Marathas. As a result, they were not inclined to support the Marathas during the Third Battle of Panipat in 1761. 
Alongside endless military campaigns, the Marathas developed an effective administrative system as well. Once conquest had been completed and Maratha rule was secure, revenue demands were gradually introduced, taking local conditions into account. Agriculture was encouraged and trade revived. This allowed Maratha chiefs, Sardars like Sindhya of Gwalior, Gegwad of Baroda and Bonsley of Nagpur, the resources to raise powerful armies. Maratha campaigns into Malwa in the 1720s did not challenge the growth and prosperity of the cities in the region. The silk produced in the Chanderi region now found a new outlet in Pune, the Maratha capital. Burhanpur, which had earlier participated in the trade between Agra and Surat, now expanded its hinterland to include Pune and Nagpur in the south and Lucknow and Allahabad in the east. The Jats were prosperous agriculturists and towns like Panipat and Balabgar became important trading centers in the areas dominated by them. Under Surajmal, the kingdom of Bharatpur emerged as a strong state. When Nadir Shah checked Delhi in 1739, many of the city's notables took refuge there. His son, Jawahir Shah had 30,000 troops of his own and hired another 20,000 Marathas and 15,000 Sikh troops to fight the Mughals. So now let's start chapter number 1 of class 8 history textbook. So let's start the first chapter, how, when and where. How important are dates? There was a time when historians were fascinated with dates. There were heated debates about the dates on which rulers were crowned or battles were fought. In the common sense notion, history was synonymous with dates. You may have heard people say I find history boring because it is all about memorizing dates. Is such a conception true? History is certainly about changes that occur over time. It is about finding out how things were in the past and how things have changed. As soon as we compare the past with the present, we refer to time. We talk of before and after. Living in the world, we do not always ask history, historical questions about what we see around us. We take things for granted, as if what we see has always been in the world we inhabit. But most of us have our moments of wonder when we are curious and when we ask questions that actually are historical. Watching someone sip a cup of tea at a roadside tea stall, you may wonder, when did people begin to drink tea or coffee? Looking out of the window of a train, you may ask yourself, when were railways built and how did people travel long distances before the age of railways? Finding the news, reading the newspaper in the morning, you may be curious to know how people got to hear about things before newspapers began to be printed. So the figure number one, this figure is Brahmans, Brahmans offering the Shastras to Britannia, frontispiece to the first map produced by James Rennell, 1782. 
Renel was asked by Robert Clive to produce maps of Hindustan and enthusiastic supporter of British conquest of India, Renel saw preparation of maps as essential to the process of domination. The picture here tries to suggest that Indians willingly gave over their ancient text to Britannia the symbol of British power, as if asking her to become the protector of Indian culture. All such historical questions refer us back to notions of time. But time does not have to be always precisely dated in terms of a particular year or a month. Sometimes it is actually incorrect to fix precise dates to processes that happen over a period of time. People in India did not, be, did not begin drinking tea one fine day. They developed a taste for it over time. There can be no one clear date for a process such as this. Similarly, we cannot fix one single date on which British rule was established, or the national movement started, or changes took place within the economy and society. All these things happened over a stretch of time. We can only refer to a span of time and approximate period over which particular changes became visible. Why then do we continue to associate history with a string of dates? This association has a reason. There was a time when history was an account of battles and big events. It was about rulers and their policies. Historians wrote about the year. A king was crowned, the year he married, the year he had a child, the year he fought a particular war, the year he died, and the year the next ruler succeeded to the throne. For events such as these, specific dates can be determined, and in histories such as these, debates about dates continue to be important. As you have seen in the history textbooks of the past two years, historians now write about a host of other issues and other questions. They look at how people earned their livelihood, what they produced and ate, how cities developed and markets came up, how kingdoms were formed and new ideas spread and how cultures and society changed. So this figure, famous all over the world, Lipton's coffee and tea's provisions. So figure number two, advertisements help create taste. Old advertisements help us understand how markets for new products were created and new tastes were popularized. These 1922 advertisements for Lipton tea suggest that royalty all over the world is associated with this tea. In the background, you see the outer wall of an Indian palace, while in the foreground, seated on horseback, is the third son of Queen Victoria of Britain, Prince Arthur, who was given the title Duke of Connaught. So, which dates? By what criteria do we choose a set of dates as important? The dates we select, the dates around which we compose our story of the past, are not important on their own. They become vital because we focus on a particular set of events as important. If our focus of study changes, if we begin to look at new issues, a new set of dates will appear significant. Consider an example. In the histories written by British historians in India, the rule of each governor-general was important. 
These histories begin with the rule of the first Governor General, Warren Hastings, and, and, and ended with the last Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten. In separate chapters, we read about the deeds of others, Hastings, Wellesley, Bandick, Dalhousie, Canning, Lawrence, Lytton, Ripon, Curzon, Harding, Erwind. It was an it was a seemingly never ending succession of governor generals and viceroys. All the dates in these history books were linked to these personalities to their activities, policies, achievements. It was as if there was nothing outside their lives that was important for us to know. The chronology of their lives marked the different chapters of the history of British India. Can we not write about the history of this period in a different way? How do we focus on the activities of different groups and classes in Indian society within the format of this history of governor generals? So this is figure number three. Warren Hastings became the first governor general of India in 1773, while history books narrated the deeds of governor generals, biographies glorified them as persons and paintings projected them as powerful figures. When we write history or a story, we divide it into chapters. Why do we do this? It is to give each chapter some coherence. It is to tell a story in a way that makes some sense and not be and can be followed. In the process, we focus only on those events that help us to give shape to the story we are telling. In the histories that revolve around the life of British governor generals, the activities of Indians simply do not fit. They have no space. What then do we do? Clearly, we need another format for our history. This would mean that the old dates will no longer have the significance they earlier had. A new set of dates will become more important for us to know. How do we periodize? In 1817, in 1817, James Mill, a Scottish economist and political philosopher, published a massive three-volume work, A History of of British India. In this, he divided Indian history into three periods, Hindu, Muslim, and British. This periodization came to be widely accepted. Can you think of any problem with this way of looking at Indian history? Why do we try and divide history into different periods. We do so in an attempt to capture the characteristics of a time, its central features as they appear to us. So the terms through which we periodize, that is demarcate the difference between periods, become important. They reflect our ideas about the past. They show how we see the significance of the change from one period to the next. Mill thought that all Asian societies were at a lower level of civilization than Europe. According to his telling of history before the British came to India, Hindu and Muslim despots ruled the country. Religious intolerance, caste taboos, and superstitious practices dominated social life. British rule 
Milfeld could civilize India. To do this, it was necessary to introduce European manners, arts, institutions and laws in India. Mill, in fact, suggested that the British should conquer all the territories in India to ensure the enlightenment and happiness of the Indian people, for India was not capable of progress without British help. In this idea of history, British rule represented all the forces of progress and civilization. The period before British rule was one of darkness. Can such a conception be accepted today? In any case, can we refer to any period of history as Hindu or Muslim? Did not a variety of faiths exist simultaneously in these periods? Why should we characterize an age only through the religion of the rulers of the time? To do so is to suggest that the lives and practices of the others do not really matter. We should also remember that even rulers in ancient India did not all share the same faith. Moving away from British classification, historians have usually divided Indian history into ancient, medieval and modern. This division too has its problems. It is the periodization that is borrowed from the West where the modern period was associated with the growth of all the forces of modernity, science, reason, democracy, liberty and equality. Medieval was a term used to describe a society where these features of modern society did not exist. Can we uncritically accept this characterization of the modern period to describe the period of our study? As you will see in this book, under British rule, people did not have equality, freedom of, or liberty, nor was the period one of economic growth or progress. Many historians therefore refer to this period as colonial. What is colonial? In this book, you will read about the way the British came to conquer the country and establish their rule, subjugating local Nawabs and Rajas. You will see how they established control over the economy and society, collected revenue to meet all their expenses, bought the goods they wanted at low prices. produced crops they needed for export and you will understand the changes that came about as a consequence. You will also come to know about the changes British rule brought about in values and taste, customs and practices. When the subjugation of one country by another leads to these kinds of political, economic, social and cultural changes we refer to the process as colonization you will however find that all classes and groups did not experience these changes in the same way that is why the book is called our past in the plural Now, how do we know? What sources do historians use in writing about the last 250 years of Indian history? Source 1. Let's read this source. Reports to the Home Department. In 1946, the colonial government in India was trying to put down a mutiny that broke out on the ships of the Royal Indian Navy. Here is a sample of the kind of records the Home Department got from the different dockyards. 
Bombay, arrangements have been made for the army to take over ships and establishments. Royal Navy ships are remaining outside the harbour. Karachi, 301 mutineers are under arrest and a few more strongly suspected are to be arrested. All establishments are under military guard. Vishakha Patnam the position is completely under control and no violence has occurred. Military guards have been placed on ships and establishments. No further trouble is expected except that a few men may refuse to work. So the administration produces records. One important source is the official records of the British administration. The British believe that the act of writing was important. Every instruction, plan, policy, decision, agreement, investigation had to be clearly written up. Once this was done, things could be properly studied and debated. This conviction produced an administrative culture of memos, nottings, and reports. The British also felt that all important documents and letters needed to be carefully preserved. So they set up record rooms attached to all administrative institutions. The village, the Sildar's office, the collectorate, the commissioner's office, the provincial secretariats, the law courts all had their record rooms. Specialized institutions like archives and museums were also established to preserve important records. Letters and memos that moved from one branch of the administration to another in the early years of the 19th century can still be read in the archives. You can also study the notes and reports that district officials prepared or the instructions and directives that were sent by officials at the top to provincial administrators. In the early years of the 19th century, these documents were carefully copied out and beautifully written by calligraphists, that is, by those who specialized in the art of beautiful writing. By the middle of the 19th century, with the spread of printing, multiple copies of these reports were printed as proceedings of each government department. So this figure number four, the National Archives of India came up in the 1920s. When New Delhi was built, the National Museum and the National Archives were both located close to the Viceregal Palace. This location reflects the importance these institutions had in British imagination. So surveys become important. The practice of surveying also became common under the colonial administration. The British believed that a country had to be properly known before it could be effectively administered. By the early 19th century, detailed surveys were being carried out to map the entire country. In the villages, revenue surveys were conducted. The effort was to know the topography, the soil quality, the flora, the fauna, the local histories and the cropping pattern. All the facts seen as necessary to know about to administer the reason. From the end of the 19th century, census operations were held every 10 years. These prepared 
detailed records of the number of people in all the provinces of India, noting information on caste, religions and occupation. There were many other surveys, botanical surveys, geological surveys, archaeological surveys, anthropological surveys and forest surveys. So, this figure number 5 is a custard apple plant 1770s botanical gardens and natural history museum established by the british collected plant specimens and information about their uses local artists were asked to draw pictures of these specimens historians are now looking at the way such information was gathered and what this information reveals about the nature of colonialism so this figure number six mapping and survey operations in progress in bengal a drawing by james princep 1832 Note how all the instruments that were used in surveys are placed in the foreground to emphasize the scientific nature of the project. So this is source 2. Let's see. Not fit for human consumption. Newspapers provide accounts of the movements in different parts of the country. Here is a report of a police strike in 1946. More than 2,000 policemen in Delhi refused to take their food on Thursday morning as a protest against their low salaries and the bad quality of food supplied to them from the police line's kitchen. As the news spread to the other police stations, the men there also refused to take food. One of the strikers said the food supplied to us from the police line's kitchen is not fit for human consumption. Even cattle would not eat the chapatis and dal which we have to eat. And this figure is the rebels of 1857. Images need to be carefully studied for their project, the viewpoint of those who create them. This image can be found in several illustrated books produced by the British after the 1857 rebellion. The caption at the bottom says, Mutinous Sifois share the loot. In British representations, the rebels appear as greedy, vicious and brutal. You will read about the rebellion in chapter 5. Okay, so what official records do not tell? From this vast corpus of records, we can get to know a lot, but we must remember that these are official records. They tell us what the officials thought. What they were interested in and what they wished to preserve for posterity. These records do not always help us understand what other people in the country felt and what lay behind their actions. For that, we need to look elsewhere. When we begin to search for these other sources, we find them in plenty. Though they are more difficult to get than official records, we have diaries of people, accounts of pilgrims and travelers, autobiographies of important personalities and popular booklets that were sold in the local bazaars. As printing spread, newspapers were published and issues were debated in public. Leaders and reformers wrote to spread their ideas. Poets and novelists wrote to express their feelings. All these sources, however, were produced by those who were literate. 
From these, we will not be able to understand how history was experienced and lived by the tribals and the peasants, the workers in the mines or the poor on the streets. Getting to know their lives is a more difficult task. Yet this can be done if we make a little bit of effort. When you read this book, you will see how this can be done. Uh, then, now let's do true or false. So, true or false, number A, James Mill divided Indian history into three periods, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, which is true. Official documents help us understand what the people of the country think. False. The British thought surveys were important for effective administration. True. So, that's the end. Bye, guys. See you in my next video.